So next speaker is Ivan Mo Viola. So his talk is visualization driven by perceptual statistics. Thank you, Romy, for introducing me. Thank you, organizers, for having me here. It's a great honor for me. Uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, work which I, which I, uh, which is currently my favorite, and I would like to reflect on what has been done uh, in what we have done in the recent uh, years, and uh, what we are thinking of what could be the possible strengths of uh, of uh, future research. So it will be reflective, but also hopefully you will find some some interesting future work information. And uh, hopefully it will be also a little bit uh, controversial uh, because uh, that, uh, that has been uh, uh, supported uh, from the early on. Um, <clears throat> my affiliation is here also the University of Bergen, although I am now primarily at the Vienna University of Technology because many of these uh, first uh, research works <clears throat> have been done at, uh, this, at this university. So I will start with the, with the pipeline, which we all, all know. Uh, I would like to just uh, place the stage for what I would like to talk about. Um, the visualization pipeline has uh, certain areas which I would call data-centric stage and, or com and computation-centric stage, uh, which relates to computational science and, or data science. And then there is uh, what I would call a human-centric stage, uh, where uh, after the, the information has been displayed, the processing continues further on the human side. And I would like to talk about the visual mapping, which is a hybrid between these uh, computational stages and the human-centric stage. <clears throat> and um, I would like to start with uh, an image which has been already shown in the, uh, in the presentation from the Mao Lab, which I was quite uh, uh, shocked that one book is uh, showing up here twice at these presentations. And this is basically the first uh, first uh, page of this book, and uh, there is there is an interesting statement uh, given for applications ranging from scientific and information visualization to technical illustration. Highlighting relevant information is far more important than visual realism per se. In such system, perceptual effectiveness becomes an implicit requirement. And they also say one approach to improving the perceptual effectiveness of computer graphics is to adapt the tools and techniques for conveying visual information used by artists and illustrators. So let's take the, the methods from the illustrators and, uh, and those who have been dealing with this problem already before. A second approach builds directly on knowledge of human vision system by using perceptual effectiveness as an optimization criterion in the design of computer graphic systems. <clears throat> so and this second, um, second approach will be very related to the talk I will be, I will be uh, uh, giving, giving here. Although, uh, there is a, there is, I would say it's a third approach to these two, because we are not building on any, any prior knowledge about human visual system. We don't have any, any model of perception. But what we are basing our optimization is rather on statistics obtained from perceptual studies from psychophysics, which doesn't mean a knowledge per se. It's a statistical. Uh, coverage of, of per, per human performance rather than an extracted model. So let's start with, uh, with the content. <clears throat> uh, in, our, in our recent work on chromatic shadows, which I don't want to talk about, we, we, made, uh, we were uh, performing a, sh a shape perception task, which has been proposed by Jan Cohen Dering, uh, and I would say one uh, guru of, uh, of shape perception from the psychophysics uh, uh, domain, uh, who came up with this gauge figure task in the in the early 90s, where you have a simple task to just align a disk and uh, and the normal to this disk to be uh, the normal should be aligned with the place where this disk is placed. It's a very simple task, and also with a simple mouse uh, interaction, you can very easily do it uh, and also fairly quickly. So we were studying in this, uh, in this uh, for these chromatic shadows, this shape perception, how people perceive the shapes in the, in the shadowed areas and so on. And we have uh, also analyzed how do they perceive slant and how they perceive the, uh, the tilt part of this, of, this, uh, of this normal. So we 
compare the real normal of a geometry which is known with a normal which it has been perceived. And the slant in the eye space means basically uh, this, uh, this angle and the tilt would mean the, this angle. So how uh, we decompose the, the normal uh, to these two, to these two uh, descriptors. And we have found out, not with tilt but with slant, that there is, a, there is a systematic error from our statistics. We were very surprised that the, uh, this is the ground truth slant and this is the estimated slant. Uh, that, that there is, there is it's, not, it's not linear, but it's, it's uh, systematically underestimated. We are looking at 3D visualizations uh, systematically in, on the regular displays, not in stereo. We are systematically underestimating these, uh, these slants. <clears throat> that, that's what the statistics basically are saying. Um, uh, and that was, that was kind of interesting to us. Why is this happening? Uh, and can we, kind of, can we improve it even more importantly? Uh, we also looked at data from another study from uh, Forrester Cole and uh, others who have also made uh, uh, this sh shape uh, uh, estimation task. And the, the curve looked pretty similar to our, to our one. So we had the different settings. Uh, different rendering settings, but the curve was very similar. So uh, we said, let's try to come up with a, with a, such a uh, model of, uh, of illumination model, which will come as close as possible to to actually the the the, the 45 degree uh, line, which will mean that the ground truth slant is uh, is uh, on average uh, well estimated. So. <clears throat> So then we also uh, had a look at uh, f having the light source at the top. How is the how is the performance? And on the top uh, part of the of the object, the performance was the best. On the bottom was usually the worst, which could uh, be uh, related to the fact that there there was a little bit less contrast in the in the in the bottom part. But we didn't uh, we didn't uh, test for that. <clears throat> Why is that? is uh, in the psychophysics literature dif uh, dif uh, explained by two, two possible reasons. Presence of frame. So if you have a frame, uh, we perceive that this is something uh, which is not really three-dimensional then. And more importantly, I think, is that there is a zero binocular disparity. So you have a conflict. If you are looking at a screen, your two eyes are saying that you are looking at a flat thing while your one eye, monocular cues, are telling you you are looking at the 3D structure, which is shown on the, on the display. And the mix is obviously not winner takes it all, but it's some kind of, uh, some kind of a mixed signal, which results in flat, <coughs> flatter perception of the surfaces as, as they should be perceived. <clears throat> so you can see a, a distribution of, uh, of the error of the slant with respect to the, to the tilt. So, over the, all the tilts, and uh, we said, well, what, how can we make a, a, the, a, the illumination model which will make us uh, possible to, to, to reach the, the, the good match between the intended information, intended slant, and the, and the perceived slant. <clears throat> so basically, we, have, we had the, this map, and we basically just inverted the map uh, uh, so we get a, some slant angle, and we get a corrected slant angle, and uh, without any more considerations, really, uh, in, a, in a blind way, we just applied this kind of remapping. So, and what we also did was we changed the algorithmic uh, model of, of illumination to something which is algorithmic and statistical. There, there is no algorithm, there is some statistics which drive actually the, the illumination. And this is the, the uh, original representation, Lambertian shading, and this is the optimized version. Where you can see on this stream surface <coughs> visualization that there are some features which stand out a little bit better. <coughs> we have uh, uh, tried to quantify how did we improve. So what we did, we also made this, this uh, gauge figure probing on this modified illumination. Uh, and uh, this was the, and we decided to compare the areas below the, the, the zero error uh, line uh, from the original Lambertian shading compared to the, to the 
optimized shading, let's call it. So this was the area of the optimized shading. This was the original shading. And there have been some improvements, most importantly, in, in this area. Uh, but I don't want to really cover the details of this at, at this moment, because I would like to get to some other points, too. <laughs> so here you can see the differences before, after. And then after we, we made the, the second uh, iteration, we, we stopped with two, three iterations. You can imagine they're doing perceptual probing with 36 participants from um, different <coughs> ages and so on. It's quite time consuming. So this is the Gecko data set with uh, after first iteration of improvement. And here is after the second iteration. So you can see that some, some structures are coming, coming up more clearly. But what you also can see is that the material seems to be different. This, is a, this would be a different material than this. So, so if, you, if you want to communicate a material, then probably you have to be very careful in applying such a technique. If your only optimum, optimal criterion is to perceive the shape in a correct way, then on a given display setup, then maybe this, this could be a, a good compromise. <clears throat> so this was one work where we, instead of doing the evaluation at the end, as it, was, as it is usual, to come up with a new algorithmic technique and evaluate how it did perform, and if it performed well, then this is a positive result. If it didn't, then it performed uh, badly, and that's it. We basically put the study at the beginning of the, of the investigation, and based on the result, we are then adapting the, the visualization technique. And so we tried to do something with uh, with the perception of relative motion. So you have, a, imagine you have a visualization of winds over North America, for example, given by a small glyphs of, uh, of, with a comet tail, and you would like to understand how fast is the wind compared to West Coast, compared to East Coast, for example. <clears throat> or, or another scenario could be, maybe we can use something like a flow legend. So there, there are flowing particles in the legend, it's animated the legend, but you would like to know uh, how much discretization steps do I need so that in between the legend people can still access this information uh, precisely? <clears throat> so uh, what we did, we, we thought, okay, we want to have a very simple uh, stimulus, which will be just two motion patterns, and we are now scaling up the, the overall motion, so, so the, the how far we still can kind of perceive really, really motion, and then we, we change the scaling. So one, one. Uh, this is the this is the base, and this is the this is the test stimulus. How far? The question was how fast is this stimulus? How faster it is than the than the base basis? And we change the the global scale velocities. We change the direction. We change the contrast type. So from a chromatic contrast. To a, to a luminance contrast, and we changed the representation, which you have seen already, uh, that you are having longer comet, comet tails or you don't have these comet tails at all. <clears throat> so, and we wanted to know what are actually the influential factors in, in having a correct uh, motion perception. And you can see that the global scale kind of uh, has, a, has an interesting uh, behavior, the faster the things are going, the more we tend to overestimate. Then chroma versus luminance using LCD screens, that is probably, uh, there is a hypothesis that using LCD screens, there was no effect uh, uh, covered by the statistics that there is a difference in per perception in contrast to the psychophysical literature, in contrast to an earlier study of Weisskopf et al. There is not really a big effect of the direction angle which is also interesting. And there is, um, there is an effect from the scale multiplier. So there is a, if I have a, let's say, the scale multiplier, one stimulus is faster than the other by two and by 10, then I, by two I will judge it more precisely, while by 10 I will say probably it is nine times, not 10 times the, the difference. So I'm, I'm a little bit underestimating, while here, uh, we tend to overestimate when the scale is going up in general. So, and we try to, to compensate for this, <clears throat> which you can see our, uh, we managed to get from a, from a uh, 
non-constant behavior to a relatively to a relatively flat uh, representation. You cannot probably see from the back. Here is zero. Here would be a zero <coughs> error line, and uh, we actually are constantly underestimating after the first iteration for the global scale and for the for the scale multiplier. The, those are the two variables which actually mattered. <coughs> uh, so we try to we change the model accordingly, uh, and. Uh, change the model and uh, after the change we are hoping we will get closer to the zero line to the statistics but obviously the, the, the perception is not a, not a linear uh, uh, system so here we got a little bit closer to the, to the zero but we are not on the, on the zero level yet. There would be more uh, tests necessary to, 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 to more iterations necessary to come up with a, with a, a compensation model which would get us to the zero line of and then we will have something which you could call a uniformly <coughs> perceiving motion space for, for guessing relative motion. So this is, these were just two iterations. And, the, and this is the model uh, where you can see, I, this is a bad vis also an example of a bad visualization. And we have to change that. But, but you can see here that uh, the correction values are differing based on the global scale and based on the speed, speed multiplier. <clears throat> so, but this can be also generalized for many different visualization types. Uh, in, let's say, information visualization, we have th these two circles, and uh, let's make a small ball. I don't perceive those as circles. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, that, that might be true. Uh, but let's, let's define that we perceive them as circles. If, if we assume this, uh, which one do you think is, uh, is bigger than the other one, or they are equal? Is the black bigger than the, the white one who thinks so? Gary? Is the white bigger than the, the green one? Amitabh, who green. thinks that they are green. equal size? What green? Green? So, sorry? Did I say, did I say green? Uh, white and black. Yeah, black and white. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So, so who <laughs> thinks they are equal? Yeah. Okay. You got it all wrong, oh. besides Garrick. So you see, I mean, there is probably something we need to do about the, about the other visual forms as well. And with, with this perceptual statistics, we can basically cover uh, and make, make the corrections. <clears throat> but it all takes a long time, right? Because oh, doing all these studies, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not really practical, I would say. Who, who can do it, really? We can do it for, as, a, as, a, as a scientific project, but, but who can do it really in a practical sense? <clears throat> and for example, the work uh, from, uh, from Kwan Liu's lab, uh, Zeng et al, a TDCG paper, they are using uh, for optimizing volume rendering, uh, ordinal depth perception uh, in volume rendering, they are using uh, uh, some perceptual models, so already an extracted model, which is then applied on the visualization, so there are no real users who are who are looking at it and making some tasks, but it's a perceptual model which evaluates which one is better than the other one. But at the end, they always have to make the perceptual validation, so at least one study is necessary there. Uh, and there you still have to hope that the model is good. <laughs> um, so one thing what you can what you could do is perhaps to, to reuse the statistics for the next iteration. And uh, what I mean by that is that if we have, if we have here data A compensation we have certain data and we apply certain compensation to this data representation but then we have a stimulus and then we have certain sensation and these two are we are basically an interplay during the test these two you don't really see yeah so what you can do is you can map to the same stimulus a different data with a different compensation and, by, and run the, the test on the same statistics, how, the, how this, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this new compensation model will behave. So that could be possible, perhaps to be done. <laughs> and maybe we can do it in such a way that some iterations will be more like uh, the iframes and the P frames in, in uh, video compression, where you have the iframes like the key frames, and the P frames are kind of in between to, to make the things faster. And then again, another iframe, which which can uh, uh, 
validate that the B frames were, were actually going the right way. <coughs> and one thing which, which I learned, uh, and I would like to share with you, that meaning of statistical mean over population can be very mean. And uh, so, for example, we had this example that, that uh, there, are, there are like uh, women like uh, dramas and, and romans and men like sci-fi and, and action movies. And imagine that you create a mean out of this movie like uh, Aliens and Cowboys comes out, which is definitely not the optimal movie, uh, or at least this is my personal view. So, so you can create a cat dog. If you have a bi uh, normal distribution, you create an average which doesn't exist. Yeah? So that's a, that's a threat. And uh, people have, for example, mental viewpoint uh, in this probing test uh, often different than the eyes are. And you have to, for example, co-register this. Uh, there is bus relief ambiguity. There are many things which you have to factor out before you do this kind of averaging. <clears throat> While this mental viewpoint and this bus relief ambiguity are, at least for certain time of life for one person, are relatively constant. So, uh, and there is a point, we are not equal. We are sometimes, sometimes some people are better in something, some people are better in something else. So why do we have to have the same visualization if, uh, if we are so different uh, in a way? So maybe we can train the visualization uh, for one person only. We can have a different visualization for me, different visualization for somebody else. And maybe the holy grail of these user studies could be just to have one participant only, always, and nearly infinite amount of samples of his performance. <clears throat> By that we could, such a perceptual statistics without knowing it uh, a priori, can, can uh, balance out some gender sensitive uh, parts of visualization if there are any, some cultural compatibilities, some color blindness even, so you can find out that people are color blind, uh, or intellectual capability. Imagine that you have a, a newspaper, which is electronic form, and you will get the visualizations there aligned with your intellectual capability. That would be just wonderful. Or insulting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and how, how this could be done? So, I don't know. And uh, Klaus has, uh, has uh, said some, some interesting uh, statements about the gaming, which could be a good direction. But uh, maybe, you know this reCAPTCHA idea, I think. The CAPTCHA is the, is the was the starting project. reCAPTCHA means that by this you can basically uh, reconstruct the content of, of scanned books. So the first word if, is, uh, is computer generated, the, the second word is unknown, and if both word, if the first word is written correctly, then it's a strong, strong assumption that the second word is written correctly, and if there is match by 10 people, then this word is, uh, is then uh, uh, made uh, uh, machine readable and the book becomes eventually uh, an uh, electronic book from the original scanned one. So this, this recapture idea is actually not contributing only to less spam but also makes uh, the books in an electronic form, which is a great idea. How about, but, but people are great in, in, uh, in hacking this. So how about having something like re-gauge figure task where you have uh, where you measure the performance, maybe in one stimulus, the non-stimulus, in the second stimulus you will have not known a priori shading, but you can have photographs, and you can have these photographs making a 3D, 3D images out of these photographs, because the, the user will estimate the, the shape in this particular area of these images. <clears throat> so that could be one way how you perhaps can make this, this uh, personalized visualization possible. And what I wanted to also say, I'm running out of time, that, that, uh, that this, this uh, loop which I was, uh, these iterations I was talking about, it very much relates to the control theory from automation and re regulation. And they have this kind of, they have developed this whole theory which is kind of already robust and working well. And they have these controllers there, which is obviously this co co uh, correction uh, scheme which, which uh, I, was, I was referring to. They have this PID, this uh, power integral and derivative aspects of these controllers. What would this actually mean in uh, such, a, such a correction scheme we were talking about? I have no idea. <clears throat> but uh, we can kind of map our, our uh, approach 
of, uh, of the visualization pipeline somehow to this uh, to the scheme of the from coming from the control theory feedback loop uh, as it is called and also one more aspect I, I would like to share with you perhaps we do not need to have at the input some some real real algorithmic visualization but we can have just an illustrator who is crafting certain 3d object let's say then we are we will be during the process of generating this illustration we will look at the, the geometry which he is drawing we will look at where he's looking at the the canvas we will look at which which uh, uh, pen uh, strokes he's doing build a causal chain make a statistical model out of that and then we will have a completely non-algorithmic visualization um, visual mapping mode which uh, is purely statistical so uh, and which goes also in the, the same direction as uh, as, uh, as uh, surveying the user survey the the content creator and that's all I want to share with you today I would like to thank uh, people I had the pleasure to cooperate with and I'm ready for a In case having these uh, these uh, statistics already from the previous studies, you can remap it to some different uh, data and the compensation model, and actually these statistics could could be could drive you to the next iteration. <coughs> so that could be kind of. But you're assuming that the statistics are, are invariant. They're measuring something invariant about you know the the, the, the visualization. Like what are you watching, right? I mean that seems to be a, that could be a you know a very strong. Design. Mm -hmm. So other thing could be like if you if you just see that uh, that uh, that you are underestimating, you can add uh, you can you, and you see you are good, getting better and better. Maybe you can try to to estimate what is the what would be the vector to, to the next iteration. And yeah. Oh, I see. Look at the parametric space. Yes. Yes. Could you go back to your interesting slide with uh, one, two, two or three? Yeah, here. Uh, could you include perceptual aspects in the visual mapping already? So, uh, design the visual mapping in a way so that perception is easier. We, uh, so, do it before you think about the rendering. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, here. Yeah. No, first, you have to see something. In a, well, you can have the model of perception, yeah, right. which is, yes, so that you can do. If you if you have such a thing, but but that is that is also a threat that uh, you know the psychophysics came out with many many models of perception, but they are very simple stimuli which are not so interesting for us. And uh, if you are you you have hard time to use those, um, and if there is not a, some knowledge extracted, then uh, you need some you need to cover it by statistics. So but but yes, you can have some. Some uh, some processing already before that. I think I've asked this question before, uh, but uh, what you do with I mean you had a listen, and, uh, and when you change the normal directions, uh, the changes the visual appearance of the image looks pretty much like contrast enhancements of the image. Yeah. Um, have you have you done any any comparison between can you actually obtain the same results without correcting the, the normal, so mm -hmm. you get a better estimate of the normal direction? You could if uh, the tilt will not be uh, uh, if if the slant will not change uh, according to the tilt, then you could find a contrast enhancement scheme. But if as it is for every every tilt angle different, then uh, then this contrasting will not work really. It's a, it's an object space <coughs> technique rather than an image space. I think what Andre is saying it could be image space because you haven't tested test, test. Oh yes, we did. You did test that work by changing the contrast in, in, in enhancement. Yes, you did. Yes, 
Okay. Well.